Time for questions to the Executive Office, and I call Harry Harvey to ask the first question. Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Speaker. Deputy First Minister, that will be question number one. Thank you. I can call you. The Department of Health has advised us that as of this morning, the Stop COVID app has been downloaded 495,745 times. Mr. Harvey, supplementary, please. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, maybe you could tell me how we can increase the numbers of those downloading and engaging with the app. Thank you. I think that um, it would be really helpful if all of us in our good office um, use every opportunity to promote the use of the app. Um, I think it's um, testimony to the public and their desire to do their part that so many people have downloaded the app. Um, I also welcome the fact that um, younger people, there's an app that's now been designed specific, specifically, if I could say that word, <laughs> for younger people, and that will obviously see an increase as well, I think, in terms of the number of people that are, that are using it. Um, I think that the, the version, as I said, that's been developed for 11 to 17-year-olds will really, really help reach more people, and we're asking our schools and our FE colleges and, and others to also um, promote this. But I just think that ourselves, just repeating the message to download the app is one of the, the key ways in which we'll increase um, the numbers of people using it. I call Pat Sheehan. I wonder, could the, uh, could the Minister tell us what supports have been provided for those who are required to self-isolate? I thank the member um, for his question. And I think that the, the self-isolation is crucial. Um, if it's a crucial part of the strategy to stop the transmission of COVID in our community. So it's really, really important that people are financially supported to self-isolate whenever it's required. Back in March, the Communities Minister, Dirdre Hargey, had introduced enhancements to the discretionary support scheme to further support people affected by the pandemic. And that includes a non-repayable COVID-19 living expenses grant to assist with the short-term living expenses where a person or any member of their immediate family is diagnosed with COVID-19 or who is advised to self-isolate. Regardless of circumstances, a discretionary support COVID-19 living expenses grant award will include a specific amount for any children in the household and can be made for periods of more than 14 days. This means that it's possible for individual awards to exceed £500, making this more supportive intervention than anywhere else, and it also will support those of lowest paid um, workers. I remain committed to working with all executive ministers to support those um, required to self-isolate and to those individuals and families who need support during these most, ch most challenging of times. I call Colin McGrath. Um, the Deputy First Minister may be aware that we were told in the Health Committee recently that there is an update due to the app which may reduce the amount of time that people actually have to self-isolate because the app works back the way 14 days. So there is an opportunity to reduce that window that a person may have to actually self-isolate. Does the Deputy First Minister know when that uh, update might be made available? Well, I wasn't aware just of that conversation on the Health um, Committee, but I certainly can um, seek to ask the Department of Health of, of that information. We're told that there's advances uh, made all, all the time when it comes to uh, the app, whenever it comes to, um, I know there's some work going on in terms of the period of self-isolation, but we're yet to see the evidence around that, but no, no doubt we'll get that over the course of the time. But I'll pass on uh, the comments to the Department of Health. I call Jim Allister. Uh, some might think there's a need now for a track and trace system for COVID small business grants, uh, following the scandalous uh, retention of such vital money by the F Deputy First Minister's party, uh, until they, she was, they were flushed out by Stephen Nolan. Why should the public not conclude that if Stephen Nolan hadn't caught Sinn Féin out, there never was an intention to pay back this money? I don't think, Ken Corley, that the question is relevant to, to the question that's been asked. However, I, I will say that what I, what I said last week and publicly, and I'm very, very happy to say it again in this House today, what happened was wrong and was totally unacceptable. And as soon as the party leadership became aware of what had happened, we moved um, swiftly to deal with the issue. Next question, I call Trevor Lund. Question number two, Minister. Victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse have endured unimaginable pain and suffering at the hands of those who should have protected them. And we're absolutely committed to making sure that they get the acknowledgement and also the redress that they deserve to help them to move forward and to rebuild their lives. 
The Interim Advocate has been working with victims and survivors groups to advise on an official apology. He has also looked at the experiences of other jurisdictions to help inform this advice. We have just received his report on the 16th of October and took the opportunity to discuss it with him on the 20th of October. He has highlighted the importance of a wholehearted apology that deals with acknowledgement, responsibility, recognition and repair. The Executive Office has engaged separately with Savia on the apology and we will be receiving a full report of their views. It is really important that we get this right since victims and survivors have waited nearly four years since the Hart report was published. And we will come forward to victims and survivors groups with plans for the apology as soon as possible. On the 6th of October, we announced the appointment of Fiona Ryan as the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Child Abuse. Fiona will take up position from the 14th of December and, as well as her critical interest in an apology, will certainly take up the issue of a memorial. Trevor Lund, supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for her answer so far. It's very, very comprehensive. Uh, she mentioned the interim advocates' activities, and uh, he has announced, I think, that the advice services will be in place from the start of December. Can the Minister advise us to, to what extent they will be available? Will it be a limited service or a full service? Um, well, you're right that the Heart Report, if you know, or as you do know, recommended that specialist support services should be available to victims and survivors offering counselling and practical help tailored to their needs. And I'm pleased to say that the Executive Office is taking steps to establish a wide range of additional services for HIA survivors. The Victims and Survivors Service will deliver uh, dedicated health and wellbeing, social support and related services to victims and survivors of HIA. Um, from, uh, from today, uh, Monday the 2nd, support is available directly to meet pressing and immediate needs, including persistent pain, disability aids and psychological support. We are intending that the HIA support service will be officially launched from the 1st of December. This will include a dedicated health and wellbeing caseworkers, outreach, drop-in and social support, local and easily accessible. Representatives of the victims and survivors groups have helped to develop the case for the support service and assisted VSS, TEO and the Interim Advocates Office in designing these arrangements. The service will build on what is already available for HIA victims and survivors and on the interim service for counselling and emotional support that was established in early summer. So I think this is another important milestone in the, in the fuller implementation of the Heart Report. First of all, can I ask members to, to assist using their mobile phones in a chamber? We're getting a lot of interference in the system here, please. Could I call Christopher Salford? Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for her responses thus far. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister to give an assurance to the House that co-design of every stage of the delivery uh, of this re re restorative scheme uh, will be at the heart because it's so important that we carry people with us. And secondly, can she give the House an update on where we're at with the financial uh, scheme in terms of compensation, specifically the contributions required from institutions? I think just in terms of your first point around co-design and co-production, I think that's essential. If we're going to get this right and actually you know, have the, the the confidence of the victims and survivors, then they have to be at the heart of designing things. That's certainly um, a commitment that I'm very happy to make in this House today. Um, the member will be aware, I think we've talked about it before, different times and questions, that uh, we are seeking um, meetings with a number of the relevant bodies and we want um, people, because everybody has to play their part. There's a huge lift and a huge responsibility here in terms of getting um, financial support um, to those uh, redress payments to those who, who need them. So we're working our way through that and we hope to have meetings with the relevant institutions in the coming weeks. Well, Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask the, the Deputy Minister, can you ensure that applicants to the address board are made aware of what information is being sought about the applicant, particularly if the board is seeking their criminal records, as this is very distressing for victims? Very happy to take that on board and I will speak to the relevant officials. Disturbed here with the, the interference on our equipment here. I'll call Linda Dillon. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers thus far, particularly in relation to those support services that have been put in place for the victims. I think that it's extremely important that they get the support they need, particularly at this time whenever they are having to go through the application process. Could the Minister give us an update on the work of the HIA Redress Board for administering the redress payments and if there have been any issues that have arisen during that process? Yeah, um, 
Thanks to the member for her question. Historical institutional abuse, as we all know, should never have happened, and it was so wrong on so many different levels, and that trust was breached and children um, violated. So they were all failed by a system that should have protected them, a system that turned a blind eye and covered up um, systemic abuse. So we owe it to them to make sure that we get this right and that they get the, re the redress that they deserve. And I know that the redress has been a long time coming. As a matter of fact, it's been far too long in coming. However, we have started to make some progress in supporting victims and survivors. The redress board opened for applications back on the 31st of March, and within seven weeks, the first compensation payments were made. And that was all within the timescales that were set out by the president of the board. This was a significant milestone, I believe, for the victims and survivors who are now starting to receive the compensation, which they are long overdue. As of the 28th of October, 647 applications have been received, 171 of them from people who participated in the Heart Inquiry. Panels have, been, uh, have made determinations totalling 5.1 million and paid out a total of 3.7 million. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, Mr Speaker, I just wonder, uh, would the Deputy First Minister be able to give us an update on the recruitment of Victims Commissioner, given that we are concerned about how many people are hurting in society, both from institutional abuse and from the conflict? Yeah, I was happy to make a statement um, to that effect to the House only a, a short number of weeks ago, and we're delighted that Fiona is going to come on board, and, and I think that will be a new beginning in terms of the, the work with the victims and survivors and, and building on all the recommendations in the Hart Report, um, the apology, the memorial, all the things that we've, been, we've committed to. So she's due to take post um, on the 13th um, of December, and we look forward to, to, that, to that post. Before I call the next question, I should advise members that oral questions 4 and 12 have been withdrawn, and topical questions 2 and 6 are also withdrawn. And I call Doug Beatty. Speaker, question 3, please. We are currently considering draft amendments to the Ministerial Code to reflect the changes in the law introduced by the Executive Committee Functions Act 2020. Following executive agreement, we will table a motion for their approval by the Assembly at the earliest opportunity. Doug Bailey, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, given that the Executive Committee Functions Bill uh, is now law, does this mean that decisions are being made by Ministers which are now outside the scope uh, of the present Ministerial Code? No, in fact, that's not, not the case. Um, we're aware that the, the Minister sought um, legal advice and, and is perfectly content that she has taken decisions in line with uh, the code as, as it currently sits. Call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thanks to the Deputy First Minister for answers um, thus far. Um, Deputy First Minister, uh, one of the reasons this place was in abeyance for three years was public, lack of public confidence in financial transparency and in uh, holding ministers to account. Can she confirm that when a new ministerial code is brought forward, it will be enforced by the Standards Commissioner, and that Standards Commissioner will have the, both the powers and the um, logistical firepower to properly hold ministers to account? Yes, I can confirm that's the case. When the Ministerial Code is in place and is confirmed by the Assembly, then um, obviously the Commissioner will work to that basis. Call Rachel Woods. Thank you, and thank you, Deputy First Minister. Could I ask for an update on when a new panel for Ministerial Standards will be appointed? I don't have that information with me, but I'm very happy to provide it to the member in writing. Well, Claire Sugden. Commentary has been asked. Thank you. Moving on to question number five, Martine Anderson. Question number five. We are making good progress in regenerating the North West and bringing about prosperity for the people of this area through recent and continued investment. The £200 million made available through the region's city deal will help us to stimulate growth and attract jobs. We are committed to the development of the Graduate Medical School at the University of Ulster's McGee campus, and through our Urban Villages programme, we are progressing the redevelopment of Median Square. We are also committed to the continued implementation of the Communities in Transition project, which seeks to support and empower those who live and work in the Brandywell and Craigan areas of the city. These critical and very significant investments will complement the great progress we have already been able to see in the redevelopment of the Abrington site. We are pleased to report the, that the procurement process to appoint a works contractor to complete enabling works on the clock tower building is now underway. An appointment is expected by the 30th of November. The works programme is expected to run for approximately 12 weeks from December 2020, dependent obviously on the weather. 
We will continue to advance all remaining development works on site and look forward to seeing these complete for the benefit these being complete for the benefit of all in the wider area. May I good minister and thank you for that full and complete answer. Uh, Passerby and Derry would have seen the new construction taking place in Embrington around the Grade A office accommodation. Um, could the minister provide an update on the second building that is being proposed for Grade A office, office accommodation in Embrington, please? Thanks to the, to the member for um, for her question. So, in terms of. Uh, the Great A developer Hearn Property Limited, they received plan approval in September 2019 and works to construct the building commenced in December 2019 and whilst temporarily delayed due to the lockdown, works recommenced in July 2020. Construction works are expected to be complete by March 2022 and when complete, we anticipate that this project will bring significant benefits to the city and to re the region and will be a key catalyst for this site. I call Gary Middleton. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer so far? Uh, on the issue of the Grade A office accommodation at, at Ebrington, uh, does the Minister have any information in terms of whether the investors are still keen uh, to put jobs in the site, given the current COVID environment? Well, um, we have no, no information to say of the contrary, so um, we would continue to work with them to make sure that this is progressed. I mean, the, the Grade A office accommodation itself is um, the construction which has commenced is going to provide like 50,000 square feet of, of office accommodation. I mean, that's huge. And then it can accommodate between 400 and 450 um, people. So I think that uh, we'll continue to work uh, with, with the contractors to make sure that this work uh, does, does continue and is delivered upon and brings the benefits that we know it will bring. Nicole Mark Durgan. Uh, I would like to thank the Deputy First Minister for her answers. Uh, thus far. Well, it is great to see uh, advancement on Ebrington that has been uh, long overdue. Has the Executive Office heard any concerns from the business community in Derry that while it's great that there will be business and office accommodation on Ebrington that it's not going to create new jobs per se, but it runs the risk of displacing jobs within the city and across the district? No, we haven't had any concerns in terms of that, but, but I think that obviously the current COVID restrictions make it difficult for ministers to get out and about and get engaging with people, but I certainly have spoken um, to numerous business people in the city and I've committed to making a, a visit at some stage in the near future. I think that where we can talk about all those, all those um, issues. There are many members that assist using their mobile phones. There's a lot of disturbance on the computer system here, um, so we're not just appealing members to do that. Uh, William Humphreys. Six. With your permission, uh, Mr Speaker, I'll answer questions 6 and 14 together. I share Mr Humphrey's desire for a Christmas period that will bring relief to the retail sector, whilst remaining safe for shoppers and those who work in the sector. We could all play a part in encouraging that in the coming weeks. The High Streets Task Force will look beyond that immediate challenge. It is clear that our town and our city centres face a range of economic and social challenges. Whilst the COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly exasperated the situation, many of the challenges are long-standing, stemming from the financial crisis of 2009, prolonged underinvestment in infrastructure and changing patterns of consumer behaviour. This calls for a strategic, sustained response, with departments and local government working in partnership to deliver a vision for sustainable town and city centres as thriving hubs for the retail services, hospitality and residential sectors. I recognise that stakeholders are frustrated that the task force is not in place already, and I too share that frustration. However, these challenges call for a sustained transformation, not a quick fix, and that needs thorough preparation and planning. We have um, asked for what work can be accelerated with detailed proposals to be brought to the Executive later this month, and that the task force established shortly afterwards. William Humphrey, supplementary. Thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Recently, I met with the Lord Mayor, the Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, and with Michael Stewart, the President of the Belfast Chamber of Commerce. Over the last two to three years, Belfast had a dreadful time in terms of retail in the, in the marketplace, given the bank buildings fire and, of course, this year, COVID. The city retailers are struggling, and they continue to struggle. They need help and support. The joint upness that the Minister referred to in answer is absolutely urgent. Can I ask the Minister to ensure that that joint dumpness will be put in place as soon as possible? And can I ask that also consideration is given to support high street traders, particularly in the city that I represent in this place, in the run-up to Christmas, which is so vital to our city centre economy? I was in city centre on, on, on Saturday morning, 
And quite honestly, the footfall was very, very poor, and traders are very concerned. And I have met them and have heard it directly uh, from them at first hand. Um, yes, I mean, I think what's key to this work is going to be the joined up nature of it. Um, none of us can afford to work in silos, so we need to work with um, both, both the industry, with local government, bringing together all the stakeholders and then bringing forward a plan. And what we intend to see is that there should be short term, medium term and longer term goals for us to, to, to reach to support um, the sector. We've said that there isn't a quick fix here and we believe that this is a complex picture um, and you're trying to fix something that's been a long time developing. So we are, we are absolutely wedded to a joined up approach and um, as I said there will be a number of um, proposals come forward to the executive before the end of the month. I call Karen Mullen. Thank the Minister for her answer so far. Does the Minister believe that the High Street Task Force has a role uh, in COVID-19 management and recovery? I think that, and that further builds on the, on the previous question. It's the, the, the challenges that, that we see that are, that are being faced by our towns and our cities are not amenable to um, a quick fix. And the decline of the, of the high street has been something that is not new. It's began long before COVID-19. So what we now need to see is action and delivery to stem the decline, make them more sustainable and plan for recovery. We need to protect our high street, our small retailers, family-owned businesses, who are all at the heart um, of our communities. These are the most challenging of, of times for, for everybody, and we need to be innovative, and we need to look at how we can bring life back into our, our towns and cities, how there can be a space in which to live, to work, and to enjoy our leisure time. And we need to work collaboratively, as I said, with all sectors, and our officials are um, currently engaged with all the stakeholders in putting together um, preparations for the High Street Task Force and bringing that forward to the Executive very, very soon. Call Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, if the Deputy First Minister agrees with the Chief Medical Officer that the R number cannot be controlled with schools and hospitality open at the same time, uh, what more does she think her colleagues in finance and the economy can do to help the 65,000 who work in the hospitality sector? There's no doubt these are the, the most challenging of times for everybody, but not least for the sectors that have been um, really badly hit. Um, we've, we're now in just over two weeks into our four-week period of intervention. We know that our objective throughout this period is to get the R rate down. Um, certainly the work that we're doing now as an executive, collectively, all ministers obviously have a, have a role to play in this. Is, what does the exit strategy look like and how can we move forward? How can we keep the virus down at a level that allows us to be able to move, to be able to move around a bit more freely? Um, so we intend to, to publish um, work around an exit strategy um, over the coming um, days and we'll communicate that to the public. But this is, this is really, really trying times and that's why whenever we moved to intervene um, and bring forward these measures, we knew we couldn't do it without financial support. We knew we couldn't do it without shoring up those businesses that have been impacted. That will always be um, our parameter. We'll always have to, um, no matter what we have to do, we need to be able to support the, the people that are struggling and certainly that will be at the heart of our decision making. Uh, Steve Egan not being in the seat, I move on to the next question. Chris Little. Nate. With your permission, uh, Mr Speaker, I'll ask Junior Minister Kearney to answer both um, questions 8 and 10 together. Our ability to reduce the levels of COVID-19 in our community is absolutely dependent on the public getting behind the effort to protect people and to save lives. Our communication strategy focuses on the steps we should all be taking to stop COVID-19 from spreading and the very serious consequences of non-compliance. This is a message that can be conveyed no more effectively than by those families who have felt the devastating effects of the virus, those who have lost a loved one to COVID-19. The Executive's public information campaign is being updated for the winter months and includes a testimonial from a bereaved family member which will be broadcast from this Friday, the 6th of November. And this personal testimony will be very impactful in communicating the very real human cost of COVID-19 and the importance of everyone doing their bit by following the restrictions limiting your contacts with others, maintaining social distancing, washing your hands well and often, wearing a face covering, maintaining good respiratory hygiene, 
downloading the Stop COVID NI app and isolating and booking a test immediately if you display the symptoms. The Compliance Communications Group, which includes representation from uh, departments as well as local government and the PSNI, are working together to ensure that a joined-up approach is taken which will maximise the effectiveness of that messaging through all channels. Chris Little. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Junior Minister for his response. Clear and imaginative communications are obviously vital to encourage behavioural change and protect uh, life and livelihood from COVID-19. Can I ask, has the Northern Ireland Executive uh, employed behavioural change experts and or considered employing local artists and high-profile people in Northern Ireland to help us with this important messaging? Uh, I thank the member for his questions. An, an integral part uh, of the work which is being carried out within the Department of Health and by the Chief Scientific Advisor and his staff is to take account of uh, behavioural uh, attitudes, behavioural change, to assess the effect of the restrictions which we have introduced in terms of how that actually obtains greater buy-in uh, from uh, the public as well as what may actually be off-putting or neurologic uh, towards impacting on human behaviour in a positive way. So I think we should work on the basis that that informs our approach, that informs our analysis. In relation to the, the need for more innovative and animated ways of communicating, particularly with our young people, that has been a recurring theme of discussion within the, the executive. I think the point is very well made, particularly when we look at the uh, nature of how the demographics have changed in relation to the increasing chains of transmission, that being within a younger demographic, that it is very important that our messaging is very targeted and very impactful. So the need to be uh, more innovative is, is a point which is well taken on board and has been emphasised to the uh, Executive Information Service and the work that they are taking forward. And to your last point, yes, absolutely, it's, it's critical, particularly when we are speaking with our younger people, that we're engaging those who uh, exist within the, the younger demographic particularly our sports stars from all of our codes, to assist us in articulating that very important message. And the kind of measures that need to be taken by young people in particular in a very, very challenging period to ensure that we uh, save lives and that they stay safe. Colm Gillernoy. Can the Minister uh, update us on the work undertaken by the Executive to strengthen the messaging on enforcement and compliance to, com to, to combat COVID-19? Uh, as the member will know, the executive has introduced emergency measures to halt the alarming levels of COVID-19 in our communities, and we're in the midst of the, the current intervention, which, which, which is very severe, it's very restrictive, but nevertheless it is designed to try and have the desired effect. And none of those were easy decisions that were taken. But our focus is to be uh, uh, emphasising the need to protect people and to save lives. And the key to that, as the member will know, is breaking person-to-person -person contact. In other words, that we break the chains of transmission. And we are trying to get a balance between the introduction of restrictions when they're needed to flatten the curve uh, of the infection, mitigating those as best we can, but also, in turn, as has been discussed during question time, the need to protect our businesses. And the steps that we are taking and have taken are informed by the most up-to-date analysis and advice which we have received. Our preference is to work with every member of our community so that we protect ourselves and each other. But where the level of compliance falls short of what is required, then the regulations, of course, will need to be uh, enforced. And the strategic compliance group, chaired by myself and the other junior minister, is working very closely with all our partners on a range of issues around compliance and enforcement and communication. And I want to specifically thank 
uh, our colleagues in local government and the PSNI for the very central role that they have been playing along with the Executive Office in the course of recent weeks. It's a very solid foundation for how we move beyond this period and into the recovery period. I also want to highlight the very important work that has been carried out in my own constituency, particularly by Antrim and Newton Abbey Council, who I think have led the way in setting a template for how other local government uh, organisations can follow suit in terms of this work within the community. We are also working to ensure public messages on the issue are heard and understood, and to that extent we have engaged with a wide range of other sectoral interests, including faith groups. But our most important partner in all of this is the community, and we must understand that the human cost of not adhering to the public health restrictions is very, very severe. So we, we all need to be responsible, to take responsibility for our actions and our behaviour. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call uh, Ms. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Deputy First Minister, I would like to ask the reasons for the failure to appoint a new head of the civil service. Can I thank um, the member for her question, and can I say that uh, we had a competition. Um, it wasn't that we weren't successful in appointing someone, but we do, um, as we outlined in our statement to the House on the 26th of September, that we are working to put in place um, arrangements to fill the Hawks position on an interim basis, and we hope to be able to say something positive about that over the course of the next uh, number of days. But until that is all finalised, we will um, say no more than that, other than to say that we will come back to this House to give the, the information here first. Rosemary Barton, supplementary. Thank you. Um, Minister, thank you for your answer. Has anybody declined an approach to be temporary head of the civil servant service? I'm not going to get into um, HR issues, but um, you know, we work through um, our HR department and everything's done according to the rules and regulations as, as laid out. But as I say, we hope to be able to say that um, we're very glad actually for the work of a number of senior civil servants who've helped us um, through this period. Dirk Baker, for example, who stepped up to, to assist us in the, in the executive. You know, you have um, the key issues of the day, whether it's COVID in the health department or whether it's um, Brexit, uh, where we also, again, have senior um, civil servants helping us out. So we're grateful for that work, but we want to be able to, we hope to be able to make a, a very positive announcement about an interim over the course of the days ahead. And I call Melissa McHugh. From Corla. Uh, I uh, uh, would the Minister agree that uh, the COVID recovery plan should promote equality, fairness and inclusion? Thanks um, for the question. As, as Joint Head of Government, I can certainly say that I'm committed to leading a, a power-sharing government that is defined by equality, fairness and inclusion. So in terms of planning for recovery and going forward, uh, we want to ensure this is a good place to live for each and every person who calls it home. We want to work with all groups to deliver um, a society with social justice, workers' rights and equality at its core. I'm also um, aware, however, of the disproportionate impact of the virus on those in our black and minority ethnic communities, on women, the impact on our children and young people in relation to education, mental health impact of the restrictions that we've had to put in place, as well as the loss of employment, particularly for those who are already experiencing poverty. Our recovery must, be, must provide for those in greatest need and for those that have suffered um, the greatest impact. Melissa McHugh, supplementary. Uh, Minister, would you also agree with me too that in addressing holiday hunger, that that must be cured, uh, must be uh, uh, core to any future COVID recovery plan? Yeah, I mean, I can say, I mean, without a doubt, this is a very stressful and difficult time for many people across our community, especially where people have found a, a sudden change of their circumstance or whether that's through you know, losing their jobs or, or reduction in income um, because of maybe hours being reduced. COVID-19 has exasperated this issue for so many people and so many families without access to financial resource. So support for those families is vital. And for all those that are struggling, we need to be able to support them. And holiday hunger, as you've raised, is an issue that indeed I and indeed the executive as a whole take very seriously. And we're determined that the executive will work um, to address this issue by working to ensure that our children are afforded the best possible opportunities to help them to succeed. Nicole, Sinead Ennis. 
Um, with ministers committed to delivering a victim's pension scheme, can the minister confirm that the executive office will make a bid for financial resource for the scheme as part of the budget 2021 to 2024 information gathering exercise? Yeah, thanks to the member, and, and I can confirm that we're uh, determined and to deliver a victim's payment scheme based on need. And as part of the budget 21-24 information gathering exercise, TEU has made a bid for finances. 21-22 um, year, 28.72 million, 22-23 year, 64.29 million, and 23-24, 72.8 million. The provision of these finances and cert financial certainty for the scheme is now key to making the same scheme um, progress. I call Sinead, Anna, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her uh, answer. Um, can the Minister update on the status and timeline of executive discussions with the British Government in respect of providing adequate resources for the scheme, given that it is British Government legislation? Well, the First Minister, the Finance Minister, the Justice Ministers and I uh, met on the 22nd of September in relation to the funding for the scheme, and we agreed to make an urgent request uh, for a meeting with the Brit uh, British Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, to discuss this issue further. In a letter dated the 26th of October to the First Minister and myself, Brandon Lewis set out the British Government's position that the cost of the scheme should be met from within the block grant. To date, he has not scheduled a meeting. This is not tenable, nor is it a sustainable position. We will certainly continue to raise the issue of finances and financial certainty, as I did with the British um, Prime Minister, until this matter is satisfactorily addressed. Nicole Linda Dillon. Apologies. Can the Minister provide an update on what discussions have, been, have taken place with the Irish Government in respect of the NDNA commitment? Uh, I, I welcomed um, warmly the Irish Government's announcement of the creation of a €500 million Euro fund for the advancement of North-South projects as part of its budget exercise on 13 October. While still at a very early stage of development, it is anticipated that the fund will support the delivery of key cross-border infrastructure projects investment in new all-island initiatives such as um, areas of research, health, education and the environment, Indress addressing the particular challenges of the North West and border communities, achieving greater connectivity on the island and enhancing the all-island economy and all aspects of North-South cooperation. The creation of this fund is a much needed and welcomed investment which will hopefully deliver practical benefits for all of our people, providing the basis for all-island cooperation. Linda Dillon, supplementary. A supplementary has been answered in the Answer the Thank you. And uh, moving on, Emma Rogan, not on her seat, and I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answers to the questions so far. Can the Deputy First Minister provide clarity on the Executive's approach to the restrictions in light of the Chief Medical Officer's claims that it would not be possible to keep or below one uh, with both schools and the hospitality sector open? You're correct. That is the Chief Medical Officer's view, and he has relayed that to the Executive in all of our, in all of our conversations. We have to be guided by the public health advice. We have to take balanced and uh, reasonable approaches. This is not easy. This is far from it. Uh, very, very difficult decisions to be made. But uh, as I said earlier in answer to a question, the Executive are working our way through the exit strategy, what that looks like. We need to be able to communicate that to people well in advance of the 13th because and we need people to have that information so that they are able to plan. So the executive work continues on this basis. Daniel McCross, supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer to that question. Uh, can the Deputy First Minister clarify if uh, she agrees with the First Minister's position that businesses should reopen if safe to do so in two weeks' time after the restrictions lift? I mean, obviously, it's the ideal that we get that we're allowed to allow maximum amount of businesses to be opened, the maximum freedom to individuals. But we're in a very, very challenging situation. We brought forward this intervention for four weeks because we had to. We had no option other than to do something to try and arrest the situation. Our determination is to make this work. But we also are, are I think, consistent across the board in saying that we want to find a way to move away from continual lockdown. That cannot be the executive policy to have a lockdown um, strategy. Um, but I, I've also been honest enough to say that you know, we have to keep all options on the table. So when it comes to what comes next, um, we need to minimise the disruption to people's lives as much as we possibly can. We need to be guided by the public health advice. We need to invest in test, trace and find strategy. We need to see uh, more advances in terms of um, the testing regime itself. We need better communication with the public, so I welcome the work that's being done in terms of that. We have another few weeks left of these interventions, and if we all... Keeps, if we all stick at it, 
we can make a real difference here and get the virus down to a level that allows us to be able to lift some of the restrictions that we have. Um, but all the while, we have to be guided by the public health advice. I call Pat McLoone. Thank the Deputy First Minister for her answers. Uh, could the Deputy First Minister provide us with some update on the legislation in relation to languages and culture bills? And thanks also to the member for his question. You know, we are committed to, to the development and the implementation of the rights, language and identity proposals that are included in the new decade, new approach. The delivery of these priorities will be important in building our shared future based on mutual respect and of party of esteem. Whilst the COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly delayed... Um, yes, it's very difficult to hear. I can't call you when people are speaking. Um, so, whilst the COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly delayed the speed at which we would have liked to see these issues progress, it has not deterred us, I can assure you, from delivering them as quickly as possible. Officials are undertaking the necessary preparatory work to legislate for the core elements of the bill, and we intend to progress the legislation uh, during the 2021 this year to create the relevant bodies as quickly as possible. Um, thanks very much indeed for, for your uh, response, uh, Prince, uh, Prince Deputy Speaker, or sorry, <laughs> Deputy, Deputy Minister. Um, sorry about that. Um, could you tell me just, uh, you mentioned there initially that there was some time frame for it. Could you tell me just what the time frame is and what articles or what elements of the bill have already been prepared? Um, well, the, if the, the member is very aware that there were three separate pieces of legislation to come forward. That work was done in terms of the, the drafting of the bills um, prior or just in advance of the NDNA. So the only delay has been um, bringing this forward and COVID has been the big interrupter. But I can assure you that um, there won't be a, a moment wasted. As soon as we receive the advice um, from officials, then I hope to be able to come back to this chamber and talk about the uh, progression of this. And Palm Cameron is not in our place, so that will bring us uh, to a conclusion. The time for topical questions. Could members please take their ease a moment or two? Thank you.